today I have the great privilege of interviewing Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, um, also known as Dr. Cates. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you so much, Patrick. Dr. K, you hold a BA in liberal arts from Thomas Aquinas College, an MA in, and a PhD in philosophy from the Catholic University of America, with a specialization in the thoughts of St. Thomas Aquinas. And then after teaching at the International Theological Institute in Austria, you joined the founding team of Wyoming Catholic College, where you taught theology, philosophy, music, and art history, and directed the choir in Scola until 2018. Today, you are a full-time writer and public speaker. You've written and edited many books, including your most recent one, The True Obedience in the Church, A Guide to Discernment in Challenging Times, and you've translated, and, and your works have been translated into 18 languages, so quite an accomplishment. Uh, Tan Books is pleased to be releasing your new book, The Once and Future Roman Rite, Returning to the Traditional Latin Liturgy After 70 Years of Exile. And this book is scheduled to release on October 4th, so right around the corner. But before we discuss your great book, I want to ask you a few questions, personal questions. Uh, many of people have seen your articles you know, on LifeSite News, 1 Peter 5, and the list goes on. But few of us know you as a person. So, Dr. K, you were born in a suburb of Chicago, and then you were raised in New Jersey. Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, Catholic faith growing up? Yes, uh, I'm the youngest of six children. Um, I always went to church with my family. Uh, my parents were very devout mass goers every Sunday. Um, I realized in retrospect that the parish that I grew up in was a rather liberal parish. I didn't understand that, of course, as a child, um, not having a, a large, a larger picture of the world uh, and much understanding of, of, uh, of the, 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 what was going on in the church. Um, but nevertheless, it got me started in church music. Um, I, I sang in the children's choir. I sang later on in the adult choir. Um, and that gave me a certain discipline for rehearsing music and, uh, we did sometimes sing very good music, uh, other times not so not so not so good music. <laughs> uh, but but yes, it was it was a good. Um, I guess I would say, I'm grateful for the fact that I grew up in a Catholic family um, and that I had those I developed those habits early on of not only going to mass but singing at mass, which has become such a huge part of my life. Later on, I discovered in high school Gregorian chant um, and and polyphony and other kinds of. Uh, wonderful classical music, and uh, that has become, you know, one of the main passions of my life after that. Excellent, excellent. And then as, as a youth growing up, what kind of books did you enjoy reading, both Catholic and non-Catholic, that really kind of uh, stirred the faith? Well, to be, to be honest, I don't think I read much explicitly Catholic literature until I was um, a senior in high school. I had an intellectual conversion in senior year. It was thanks to a philosophy class I took taught by a very um, inspiring and eloquent teacher who was himself a Catholic convert. Uh, and although it was a political philosophy course, he had us reading St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas along with Aristotle and Plato and many other um, uh, amazing authors. And uh, it, it really fired my imagination, and it, it, it gave me such an enthusiasm for learning that I never had before um, that I decided actually to, do, to, uh, to study philosophy from that point onwards. Just that one course in, in high school made me want to become a philosopher, but a Catholic philosopher, um, mainly through reading St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, so that's, that's, that's when my, my, the real intellectual adventure began for me. Oh, was that at a Catholic high school? It was, a, okay. it was an all-boys Catholic private school, yes. Excellent. A Benedictine high school, in fact. Yeah. Very good. And uh, when you're not writing, which, you know, it seems to be you're, you do that a lot, quite a bit, what do you enjoy reading today? Like, what are you currently reading? I, I really love to read books out loud. Um, I've been doing that in my family for, oh, probably, I mean, over 20 years. Uh, almost every evening we, we get together and we read something out loud. Uh, now it's just my wife and I at home, but we still do that. We still try to keep that up, um, not necessarily every night, but many nights each week. Uh, so we, we've read 
nearly every novel of P.G. Woodhouse. He's my favorite uh, comic author. Um, I, I think he's a, a real voice of sanity, uh, and he's hilarious, too. Um, but we read nonfiction as well. Um, we just re recently finished, my wife and I, reading um, James Matthew Wilson's book called The Vision of the Soul, which is very profound and very beautifully written. I highly recommend it. Um, it's, it's a pretty heavy lifting book. It's a big, fat book, but it's, it's extremely well done. Um, I've, I've enjoyed recently uh, reading Father Brian Houghton. Uh, he, he wrote this novel called Judith's Marriage uh, in the 1970s, mid-70s, um, and it's a very um, incisive look at the changes in the Catholic Church at that time. Um, beautiful, beautiful book. But what we, if you were to say, like, if you could take, like, two books with you, you, know, you always get that question, you're on a stranded island, what would you, what would you take with you? Oh, that's, that's a difficult <laughs> question. I think... It, it, from an intellectual point, well, I would I would take a Bible with me. You got to have the Bible if you're going to be on an island. You're going to do a lot of lexio divina sure. and prayer, so you better have the Bible. Um, but from an intellectual point of view, I think I would take the Summa Theologiae. There is a one volume edition of that in Latin, uh, which shows you could kind of sneak that whole thing in on the under the other arm. Um, but um, I don't know. I mean, I think if I, if I had stereo equipment on the desert island, I would want to take uh, my set of the complete works of Johann Sebastian Bach on 170 CDs <laughs> and spend my time really getting to know that music uh, intimately. Yeah. Oh, very good. Now, how about saints-wise? You know, you, you mentioned, you know, previously when you were in high school, you know, some of the you know, like I think you mentioned St. Augustine. What, what are, who are some of your, your favorite uh, saints and, and why? Yes, that's a wonderful question. It's actually a really difficult question because the saints are so colorful and so, so full of variety. And, uh, and, they've, and, and at different points in my life, it's, you know, different saints have played a major role. Almost like I think the saints, if, if they see that we're serious about the faith, they intervene in our lives. It, you know, it's like when Jesus says, it is not you who have chosen me, but I have chosen you. I think the saints pick us out and they, and they start to put them, kind of insert themselves into our lives. So um, for me, obviously, St. Thomas Aquinas has been a huge influence on me all through my life. Um, I, I ended up writing my doctoral dissertation on St. Thomas, uh, on the ecstasy of love and the thought of Thomas Aquinas. Um, and, you know, I would say in terms of like the whole framework of how I think about the faith is Thomistic. It's deeply informed by St. Thomas. Um, but another influence on me was St. Louis-Marie de Montfort um, and his true devotion to Mary. And not just that, but The Secret of the Rosary and his book on, on uh, Jesus Christ as the eternal and incarnate wisdom. Um, and just I, a bunch of things by St. Louis de Montfort that I read. There's a, whole, there's a volume called God Alone that has all of his writings in it, which I studied. Um, and uh, that was you know, profoundly nourishing to me. Um, St. Benedict is, has been another huge influence on me, just reading his rule. Um, as you know, I'm a Benedictine oblate, mm -hmm. and uh, I read the rule every day. You know, there's a little piece of the rule every day that monks and nuns and oblates are supposed to read and think about and try to apply to their lives uh, if you're a layman. Um, and, and so I've read the rule now, you know, probably a couple of dozen times. And I just find that in all sorts of subtle ways, the way that St. Benedict thinks is the way that I think now. Could you give me like a specific way, maybe an example, like where you felt like that saint was, even your writing and your speaking, it was just out of the blue, it just came and it was like, this is a divine mm -hmm. inspiration from a saint. I can, well, I don't know if I, I don't want to say that I've had like a <laughs> mystical experience, but, uh, but I'll give you two examples. Um, so in our family, we have the custom of picking a saint for each year on January 1st out of a hat. And we've got I don't know, a couple of hundred saints in there, and we pick out the saint, and that's your special saint for the year. And so a couple of years ago, uh, I pulled out um, little Nellie of Holy God, who you, know, I'm sure you know about her. She's not canonized, but... We, we have a book. Yes. Uh, her for ten uh, books, great little Exactly, and I've book. read that, yeah. and my children have read it too, I, and that's how I got to know about her to begin with, and that's why she ended up, you know, as one of the saints listed. Um you know, sort of like you could say, like equivalent canonization, you know, and we all know that she was, uh, she died in the odor of, of sanctity. Um, and so I picked out her name. And it was that year that I felt a tremendous desire and need to write a book about the Holy Eucharist. And that became my book, Holy Bread of Eternal Life from from Sophia Institute Press. 
Um, and, in, and in fact, in the forward to, or in the preface to that book, I say, I think the reason that I did this book at this time was because little Nellie was my patron for this year and she wanted me to do this. Um, she, she, you know, she obtained that, that grace for me. Um, and then this past year, my, um, my patron saint for the year was St. Rita of Kasha. Uh, and the thing that's neat is th about that is that St. Rita, it was her feast day, the day that I became a Benedictine oblate, that I made my final oblation was May 22nd, the fe feast of St. Rita. Then I picked her again last year as my patroness, and I ended up having a similar experience. I, I finished a book, again for Sophia Institute Press, uh, on, the, on marriage and family and pro-life themes. Uh, and of course, Saint Rita is one of the great patron saints for marriage, you know, and especially for for you know troubled and difficult marriages. Um, so anyway, these are, I, I think the saints are much more active than than we realize sometimes. Absolutely. In in terms of saints, and then we earlier we talked about devotion. Is there a if you were to say like your favorite devotion? Would you say the Rosary, the Holy Face? Is there there's one out there that mm. you just if you said like Doctor K? You know, like I always joke, you know, the saints are like. Oh, you know, St. Therese of the Child Jesus, you know, if you, if you were religious and what would it be? Dr. K of the... Of <laughs> it would, it would, it would probably be Dr. K of the solemn high mass uh, or something like that. If, if you could I, I use, love it. use such a, an expression. Um, no, I mean, in fact, there, there are two things that have been very important to me uh, as a Catholic for a couple of decades now. Uh, one is the rosary, the daily rosary, um, and at night before bed, that's 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 become my, my sort of night prayer. We also, in our family, when our children were younger, we would sing Compline, like a sort of miniature Compline, and we would sing it in chant. Um, and so it's it's it, we did that for a long time, but uh, in more recent years, we just shifted to praying the Rosary. Um, so that's 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 a, a pillar. And then the other thing is the Divine Office, um, the monastic Divine Office in Latin. Uh, I try to pray. Um, one or several pieces of that every day um, as, as a Benedictine oblate. Beautiful. Dr. K, I, um, I read that you went to Georgetown for a year and then you started at um, St. Thomas, or Thomas Aquinas College in California. What made you decide to leave Georgetown? And maybe can you speak a little bit about the importance of it, obvious, besides the obvious reason, but, <laughs> but, and then also you know, what made, kind of the importance of attending a Catholic university, you know, we have many parents that are watching mm. the show and, you know, finding that solid Catholic university. So maybe you can speak on that a little. Yes. Well, you, so to be honest, I went to Georgetown University more because my parents really wanted me to go there. Um, you know, it, it has a prestigious reputation and my, my brother had gone there before me, um, you know, and uh, I, in my heart of hearts, I really wanted to go to Thomas Aquinas College for, for precisely the reason I said earlier, that I, I had fallen in love with St. Augustine, St. Thomas, Plato, Aristotle. I wanted to read those kinds of authors. I wanted to read the great books. Um, you know, I didn't really want to go to a conventional university after discovering those things, but I had already been accepted. My parents really wanted me to go there, so I, I gave it a shot. Um, there was an honors program that I went into. And the first problem was that as freshmen in the, in the honors program, the liberal arts seminar, uh, they started us with the 19th century. So we were reading, in literature, we were reading Dickens and Wordsworth, and, uh, and, and I think we read some Blake, even though he's a little bit earlier. Um, and, and then you know, in philosophy, we were reading Feuerbach and Hegel and Marx. and all the students were so confused because they had no preparation. They hadn't studied anything prior to these authors in high school. Um, and so it was, it was like coming into a really long conversation very late and being expected to you know, participate in that conversation, you know, the great conversation of Western philosophy, which goes back you know, 2,500, 3,000 years. Um, and so I found it to be really academically incoherent. And I thought, why are we not starting with the Greeks? Why are we not going in a chronological order? You know, why aren't we starting with logic and, and you know, the, the fundamentals and building on that instead of th throwing us into Marx, for goodness sakes. Um, and, so, uh, I, and so that was one problem. But also just the, the, at the environment at the, at, at the university was so uncatholic. I mean, it's a, it's a Catholic in name only institution, just like, unfortunately, many of our politicians are Chinos as well, right? Um, I mean, I don't need to mention names. We all know who, who, who the problem is uh, in this country or who the problems are. Um, and so, uh, you know, although I met a few really good Catholics there, um, 
overall, it was a, it was a sort of saturated and secularism campus um, with you know lots of drinking and fornication and drugs and it really it, it gave me it gave me such a sour taste that I also realized you know I need a, a good moral environment I need to go to a place where people are practicing the faith taking it seriously um, and so I, I always say to parents who are thinking about college don't get caught up in the reputation of the college don't get caught up in how many students attend you know what what you need to think about is what are the people like on campus? What are the students like? What kind of friends are your children going to make when they go to that college? Um, if, you, if, 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 you, if a Catholic goes to a college with 200 or 2,000 students who are generally more practicing and more devout, they'll make a lot more friends than if they go to a, a university with 10 or 20,000 students that's very secular. It's almost counterintuitive, but the smaller the campus, the better the experience for the student. That's that's the case, and that's I've seen that verified in so many instances. Yeah. And then uh, following your undergrad, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you, you earned a master's in philosophy and a PhD in philosophy from the Catholic U, uh, and your dissertation was on the ecstasy of love in Aquinas. Can, can you speak on this topic, like why, why this topic? Uh, it's a very stirring topic. <laughs> uh, so I, I, was, um, I was really struck at one point in, in, in grad school when I was, uh, you know, hadn't decided yet what I would write my dissertation on, um, but I had taken a course on the ethics of St. Thomas, and uh, of course when you study the ethics of St. Thomas you quickly realize that it's all about love, it's all about charity, um, the love of God poured into our hearts. And so um, we, we spent a lot of time on the treatise on love in the Prima Secundae of the Summa and the treatise on charity in the Secunda Secundae uh, of the Summa. And in the, in the Prima Secundae, St. Thomas has a question, it's question 28, called On the Effects of Love. And he, he's, he asks, you know, is union an effect of love? Is um, mutual indwelling an effect of love? Is zeal an effect of love? Uh, uh, does love wound the lover? So he, he's asking these questions that sound much more like mystical theology than you typically expect to find in the kind of sober, rational, scholastic that St. Thomas is and that he has a reputation for being. Um, but one of the questions, or one of the articles there was, is ecstasy a, uh, an effect of love? Uh, and St. Thomas says yes, and he explains various ways in which love draws the lover out of himself. It draws him out in his affections. He, he, he spends his, his time doing um, things for the beloved, not for himself, um, his, his, and it draws him out in his thoughts towards the beloved. He's not thinking about himself, but about the beloved. And so both in terms of, of cognition and in knowledge and in terms of appetite or desire, uh, you know, uh, love makes the, the lover ecstatic. Um, and I, I just found this to be such a beautiful and suggestive and rich idea that I thought, well, gee, I mean, you know, I, I should look into this some more. And I discovered to my surprise that almost nobody had gone deeply into this question. It was mentioned here and there in this or that book or article that Th Thomas said this, but nobody had written a full study on what he means by the ecstasy of love. So that's, that, that's why it became my, my dissertation topic. Um, and I discovered going through his writings that he talks about ecstasy and the related, related idea of rapture, uh, raptus, and ecstasis in Latin. Um, he talks about them in some 70 places, and so it comes up in a lot of different writings, and I looked at all of those and compared them and contrasted them and so on. It was, it was a fascinating project and very uh, also spiritually, I would say spiritually nourishing, which is not what most people think when they think of a dissertation topic. You know, they think, oh, what a chore to get done with, but for me it was so enriching. It's, it's beautiful. I mean, I often think about some of the saints, you know, like Teresa of Avila, you know, that's in the famous, uh, she has a, there's a famous uh, statue of her, right, in, in Rome, uh, Bernini with mm -hmm. the arrow pointing through her. And often we mm -hmm. think of the brides of Christ as having yes. this ecstasy, this union, but even the, the male saints, you know, that they had this, this rich union with God. Right, exactly. And one of the things that was really helpful about working on, on ecstasy and Aquinas is that uh, you very quickly realized he wasn't talking about extraordinary mystical phenomena. I mean, there are extraordinary mystical phenomena, and, and, the, and the term ecstasy is often used in, the, in connection with somebody like St. Teresa of Jesus. But St. Thomas was trying to describe 
a characteristic of true love in general, even in natural love, even, even um, let's say, in a great um, sort of romance uh, that, that, that love will draw the lover out of himself towards the beloved. Um, of course, it will do so imperfectly until grace is involved. But he's trying to describe something that's true about human psychology and about, about how, human, how human nature is. Thanks. Now, uh, and it says you helped found you know, Wyoming Catholic College in, in 2006. Did you end up teaching, um, as far as your dissertation, did you end up teaching some of, like a course on that? Or is that just, uh, you know, like, have you used, utilized that dissertation going forward? Uh, yes. Um, well, you know, so Wyoming Catholic College, like Thomas Aquinas College, is a great yeah. books program for four years. So it's it's going to be dealing with maybe more what you could call meat and potatoes subjects, you know, um, some something like the ecstasy of love, it would be perhaps too particular, and there aren't electives. Yeah. But, um, but it certainly, you know, that theme does come up. Uh, it came up, for instance, when when we read in class, uh, Pope Benedict the 16th encyclical Deus Caritas mm -hmm. Est, where uh, Pope Benedict in the first part of that encyclical um, talks about Christian love as agape and as um, and as eros, and what's the difference between these two kinds of love? Um, one is more of a needy, need-based love, and the other is more of a giving and self-giving love. Uh, and actually, the notion of ecstasy is right there in Deus Caritas Est, so it, it certainly came up. Yeah. And then, what did, what made you decide to leave teaching? And then, do you miss teaching? Is there times when you're writing, you're like, oh, I wish I was back in the classroom. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure. I, I do miss teaching sometimes. Although, fortunately, um, you know, as, as a big part of my work right now, I travel around a lot, giving lectures. Um, at least once a month, I'm on the road um, giving talks. And when I go and give a talk somewhere, I always uh, make sure that there's a Q and A period, and that feels like being in the classroom again. You know, with a, a, a good lively Q and A is like a seminar class for me. At least it feels that way. Um, and and then I often you know end up having meetings with people, and I and I, I feel that I'm still teaching. Um, even though now I'm teaching primarily through the medium of, of writing and, and lecturing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, certainly um, I, I've also taught some online courses, and, and that has kept me kind of in the, in the game. So. Now, not only do you have this, you know, the book coming out on the Roman Rite, but in the, uh, we're excited to have a future book, probably most likely next summer, on sacred music that, you're, that you've written. What kind of music do you enjoy listening to? Yeah, um, I have my favorite composers for sure. Um, I mentioned earlier Bach. Generally speaking, when it comes to let's say secular music or instrumental music, uh, I'll say secular music. Um, Baroque composers are my favorite. So Bach, Handel, Vivaldi, Corelli, all these amazing uh, Baroque composers, um, as well as some some ones that are maybe less less lesser known, like Buxtehude, um, and. Uh, um, but I also really love certain modern composers as well. Um, I have a great love for an Estonian composer named Arvo Pert, uh, who's probably the most performed living composer. Uh, he was born in 1935, so he's, he's getting quite old now. Um, but uh, he's, his music is really special. It's, it's luminous and, rather, and, and somewhat mystical, I guess you could say, and, um, and very intense. Um, and it has a pretty high degree of dissonance, but but in such a way that um, there's a luminosity to the music. And it's, it's very, he's always setting to music um, religious texts, whether Latin texts or Slavic texts, you know. Um, so I, I really love Arvo Pert's music, but also Goretzky, <clears throat> um, a Polish composer, Goretzky, an English composer, John Taverner. Um, you know, there are, uh, there are quite a few modern composers whom I've really grown to enjoy. Um, as far as, you know, Gregorian chant and Renaissance polyphony, I mean, those are my beloved sacred music um, genres. Um, but there I, I have the, the good fortune of just singing in a men's scola every Sunday at the Latin Mass, uh, and we sing that music. You know, we sing it for the purpose for which it was made. Now, and do you like to listen to music when you're writing, or is it just like in your car or just at nighttime when you're, <laughs> before you go to bed? <laughs> I, I used to. You know, I think I think sometimes... 
people develop or they, they change over their the life over their lives their listening habits change when i was in grad school i used to like when i was working on my dissertation yeah. i used to blast romantic symphonies you know like brahms and wagner and well wagner not for symphonies but brahms and mahler and bruckner uh you know and, and schubert and i'd have all these things on really loud and i now i think how could i possibly have concentrated you know <laughs> i hope the writing is coherent um, because now when i when i write I actually um, i prefer to have it either quiet uh or or maybe some quiet instrumental music baroque music yeah, yeah. it's there's this because i spent some time in a monastery a benedictine monastery and there was a, a quote that I read from Blessed Columba Marmy, and, and I think he said something like this. He goes, there's some nuns, when they sing, they bring the angels to light. There's other nuns, when they sing, they put the demons to flight, mm. you know, referring to the, the bad voices. But I think about, it made me reflect on chant and how it brings God so much delight, and also at the same time it repels mm -hmm. the demons. You know, mm -hmm. exorcists talk about this, mm -hmm. listen to chant, and just the, the, the importance. And I, I didn't know if you, if you yeah. want to just, just talk real quick about you know, just... The, the beauty of chant and uh, and, and that and oh, that spiritual battle too. Yeah, my goodness, no, no you're you're absolutely right about that. Um, Gregorian chant, you know, you could almost say it's like musical holy water. You know, it, it uh, when, you know when you get sprinkled with it sonically, you know, it it uh, it, it 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 turns your mind to God. Um, it it purifies your your passions, your intentions. Um, it it's music that is purely sacred. It has no other function. Um, it's not like many other kinds of music can be can have like a multi multi-purpose like a multi-purpose tool. You know, you can use it in different contexts for different reasons. Um, but chant is specifically and exclusively sacred, and everybody knows that. I mean, even Hollywood seems to know that because if they want to evoke Catholicism, you know, they go and find a beautiful church and they have Gregorian chant playing because they, everybody knows that this is Catholicism, right? I mean, everybody except, unfortunately, some. Some you know some of our clergy don't seem to have gotten the memo yet about that, but but no. So chant is um, it's it's a it's a kind of wonderfully strange music for us because it doesn't have a regular metrical beat. So it, you can't you know you can't. It's not like marching music or waltzing or something. It doesn't. It, it floats and flows along because it's following the shape of the words. It's the you know the music is following the words and is illuminating the words, um, and there's a kind of um, spiritual like a subdued spiritual uh, joy and elation in those chant melodies uh, if they're sung well that I think it just carries your soul you know to God um, and <clears throat> I've been singing chant now for 30 years uh, more than 30 years actually um, and I just love it I never get tired of it it's it's a it's a it's an etern it's an eternally fresh music um, you know, and uh, I can't really say, I mean, there's almost no other piece of music that d doesn't become cloying if you listen to it too much. Like, oh, I've heard that too many times. I don't want to, you know, even like Vivaldi's Four Seasons, as great as it is, if you listen to that every day, you'd get tired of it. Yeah. Um, but I've been singing chant, you know, at least every week, if not more often, for, for over 30 years, and I f love it more than ever. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. I'd like to talk a little bit about your spiritual life. I mean, you know, you have a son that's, uh, you're a Benedict Nable, and then your son is a Benedictine monk in Ireland. Can you tell us about how, you know, the Benedictine spirituality influences your own life? Yes. Well, it, it has a huge influence just because Benedict's main principle for his monks is that uh, nothing should be put before the work of God. That's how he mm -hmm. says it. And the work of God, the phrase in Latin is opus dei, means for him divine worship. It means liturgical worship. Uh, and so Benedictine monasticism is essentially an or, a form of life organized to gather people in an optimal way for celebrating the sacred liturgy. That's the pinnacle of their life. That's the purpose of their life. If you were to say, what is the raison d'etre of a monk or a nun? It's to worship God liturgically. And obviously then that means that the rest of their life is ordered to that. So their private prayer, their meditation on scripture, even the work that they do, whether they're making rosaries or making candles or whatever they might be doing, you know, to support the monastery or <coughs> publishing books, <clears throat> all of that is meant to be taken up and, and made into a liturgical offering to God, um, almost like the offertory gifts, you know, are, are, are offered up to God. Um, and so f the centrality of the liturgy which is, you know, typical of, of, of monastic life and of Benedictine life in particular, um, is, you know, of course, that, you know, my, my greatest uh, 
uh, interest and, um, and passion has always been the sacred liturgy, and that's what I write about the most. Uh, so I, I feel like there's, a, there's quite a natural fit there. And the Benedictine life also reminds us of the primacy of God and of prayer and of the spiritual life over all worldly and earthly concerns, even in the church. Um, so in, in the church, you know, praising and honoring God, adoring the Lord takes precedence over, let's say, evangelizing and feeding the poor and whatever. All those things are extremely important. The church has always done them and always will do them. But if they're going to be sanctified, if they're really going to be Catholic, they need to be rooted and founded on the liturgy and on, on glorifying God for his own sake because he's worthy of glory. So I think that, that monasticism is a permanent reminder to us of seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. Um, and my conviction is that the, the, a large part of the crisis in the church is having inverted that so that now the motto seems to be, and unfortunately even for high-ranking officials in the Vatican, the, the motto seems to be seek first the things of this world, seek first political solutions, mm -hmm. seek first you know, immigration policy, and let the kingdom of God worry about itself or, you know, or seek that when you've got some spare time. And when you make that inversion, God cannot bless that because you're, it's, it's disordered. It's, it's you know, when I see the when I see monks or religious, it, I'm like reminded of eternity. I look at them and, and just that for all eternity praising God. Um, now, what advice would you give to parents to you know, having a son that's a, a Benedictine monk and you know raising a child? Like, did you guys pray that one of your your children would become a, a monk? And then also maybe that idea of detachment. It's a tough thing to you know. You're, you're blessed with a child that goes to the seminary or religious life, but then when push comes to shove, you know, then you don't see them as much. Yes. So it's a, it's a sacrifice. And even St. Therese, I love what she said. She goes, my parents will be blessed a hundredfold more than me. You know, that, that passage about mm -hmm. whoever leaves everything behind. And she goes, that, is, that applies to parents as well. Mm -hmm. So just maybe if you can That's touch beautiful. on that. Yes. Oh, by the way, I should have said earlier that St. Therese is also one of my favorite saints, and but I won't get into that right now since you asked me a different question. Um, no, I mean, I, I think, no, you're right about the sacrifice. It is a huge sacrifice. Um, I think, you know, even more for the mother than for the father. I mean, the father, they both miss their children when they go away, you know, to college and when they go off and, and maybe they get married or whatever they do and they don't... and and they don't necessarily stay close to the home. I mean, if they do, that's a great blessing. But children going off, even if they do stay in the same town, there's always a sense of separation and, it, and, and a necessary and healthy um, kind of distance that has to form, you know, so that the children can form their own life and can take, you know, can take up what, the, what their own um, state of life is supposed to be. And I think that mothers feel that very acutely because, you know, I mean, they bore the child in their womb and they nursed the child and they, and they took, you know, that there's such a, an intimate bond between the mother and child that I think the sacrifice is huge for them. Whereas fathers are kind of like, oh, you know, be well, be successful, go off and do your thing, you know, and, and uh, you know, make sure you stay in touch. But, you know, so they kind of want to, like, push them out of the nest in, in a certain sense. Um, but, no, as far as vocations go, I mean, I just think it's inherent to Catholicism that we should always be asking the Lord to raise up vocations to the priest in religious mm -hmm. life. And therefore, out in, in honesty and integrity, we should we should also be asking God, do that with our own children. Don't it would be strange to, to to pray to God for priests and religious, but only from other people's families. I mean that's that's absurd. We should ask but at the same time, you know, I think no parents should be disappointed if if a child doesn't become a priest or religious, you know, our prayer should always be God's will be done. And Lord, if you want to give a vocation to this family, please do it. You're free. You're, you're sovereignly free to do so. I am ready to surrender my child. Um, and already that's what, that's what God is asking for. He, he, we can't make anything else happen, right? We have to, to trust his, his grace. It's a good point. Because I think sometimes, you know, you seem very, see traditional circles, people, kind of pressure their children mm -hmm. to be priests or religious, and that can backfire on you. And I always loved, you know, the story about Fulton Sheen, that his parents always prayed that he would have be a priest, but they never told him. So I, that always struck me, you know, just yeah. pray for that. And if yes. it happens, you know, it's, you know, it's God. pray for, above, above all, pray that your child becomes a saint. Exactly. I think that, that's the most important Exactly. Thing. Yeah. And, and um, 
I, I think that that uh, what parents can do and should do is make sure that their children are reading the lives of the saints. Make sure that it's a normal idea that men and, that uh, young men and women become religious or that men enter the priesthood. That that's just normal, right? There's there's nothing strange or, or unusual about that. Um, and also then to, to take the children to visit a monastery from time to time. You know, go to Clear Creek on a family trip and spend a couple of days there. Um, or go and visit, you know, have your son who is 18 or something go and spend a vocation retreat at, you know, the priestly fraternity of St. Peter in Nebraska or something like that. In other words, let them have experiences where they can pray deeply and ask the Lord, what do you want me to do? Because if we don't ask, we won't receive. And that's what... I was reading about St. Alphonse. It's like his parents would always take, uh, his dad would take him on a retreat with him. So it's, I mean, if you le read the lives of the saints, you realize from a young age, their yes. parents were cultivating that vocation. Yes. So, and then um, after you shared on your pre-order page, this was, I think, a couple, maybe last month, uh, I read a, about your, your future book, The Once and Future Roman Rite. Uh, I, I kind of chuckled a little bit. A priest had a comment. He goes, referring to you, he goes, you write faster than I can... Uh, read your writings. He goes, or, yeah, you write faster than I can read your writings. Where does, you, and then I guess I want to know, where does your inspiration come, come from? And have you always been, you know, blessed with this skill, you know? Uh, I, so my, uh, as for as long as I can remember, um, writing has been something I've enjoyed doing. I mean, even when I was in grammar school, um, I was in a Catholic grammar school. So I went to Catholic schools all my life, except for two years, two, two painful years that were at a public school. Uh, but I, there was one summer, or there was one uh, school year when my parents were going on, were going to go on a long trip, and they wanted to take me with them because I was the only child at home at that point. Um, they were going to Australia and New Zealand, so it was going to be a really sp special trip. And they said to the principal, "Can we take our, you know, can we take our son out of school and bring him with us?" And the principal said, "Of course, as long as he writes a report uh, afterwards that you know has to be a very detailed report, and we'll count that as his schoolwork, right?" So, so this is a neat opportunity. And I wrote this, I think I wrote like an 80-page account, which I lost. I, 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 I'm disappointed because I think it would have been hilarious to read it now. It was like in, you know, fifth grade or something. I wrote this long account of Australia and New Zealand and my thoughts about it. So anyway, so I've, I've always enjoyed writing. Um, my father helped me to be a good writer. He, he used to look at my writing. I would give him my, my writing assignments, and he would critique it with a red pen. And he would say, you know, don't use which in this case. Use that. And, okay, this comma is in the wrong place. And, you know, he was, he was a real good teacher for me for uh, in addition to the teachers I had at school um, but uh, but no I mean once once I fell in love with once the intellectual life was activated and energized in me by that philosophy course I mentioned um, you know then I, I I don't know what it was but I realized that there's something about writing down your thoughts as you're reading books um, or as you're having conversations with people and then reflecting on it, there's something about writing which, which hones your thinking. You, you don't really know what you think until you write it down, until you try to write it down. A lot of people think they know what they think, but they don't really, they're confused and there's a lot of, uh, you know, things are mixed up in their heads. And the, when you sit down and, and write, okay, here's the argument you quickly see, oh, I think that premise is weak, or there's a missing link here, or there's, there, what's wrong? Something's wrong here. It's not actually as clear as I thought it was. Um, so writing then almost becomes like a diagnostic tool and like a mirror that you hold up to, your, to yourself and to your thoughts um, to be more rigorous, to be more demanding. Um, and if you, it's also like writing a, a journal or writing a diary, which is also something I've done for a long time, not always, but for various periods of my life. Um, and I find that extremely fruitful uh, spiritually as well to reflect on the day to say what you know what went well, what what, what went wrong, yeah. um, almost like the Jesuit examination of conscience, yeah. but to do it in written form. Um, and you know, obviously, you have to be sure that that book yeah. you know doesn't get into the wrong hands. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, <clears throat> yeah, so I, I think writing is a wonderful spiritual discipline. Uh, in fact, I think Father John Harden many decades ago wrote an article called something like writing as a spiritual discipline which i had never seen until recently but um but i so anyway that's something I, i've just had the habit and i've developed it for so long that now it's it's re, it's relatively easy for me if there's some topic that excites me 
or that infuriates me uh, than than to you know to, to sit down and write. Do you keep it. like a little journal with you? I was just wondering you know, if you're at you know in the middle of mass or you're in prayer. And, you know, the stock comes and you're like, okay, Lord, I got to focus on you, but I'll, I'll come back to that later. But uh, there you go. <laughs> so I have this little, I have this little notebook. Uh, I have lots of these. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and I always carry this in a pen around with me, or at least most of the time if I remember to. Um, and, yeah, I would say it's actually almost a, um, an occupational hazard at this point because there are often times when I'm sitting in mass, in a high mass or solemn mass. Um, it doesn't usually happen in low mass. And something about the liturgy will inspire me so much. Like, I'll see something I've never seen before. I'll think of some connection that I never thought of before. And I'll just quickly pull out the notebook and jot down a couple of words, you know, like because I want to come back to that later and think about it some more. So it's neat. And then switching gears, the Latin Mass, also referred to as the extraordinary form, I'd like you to describe the most beautiful liturgy that you've ever attended Perhaps it even moved you to tears. Where was it? Take mm. us through it. You know, what was the occasion of it? That, gosh, that's a hard question because, in fact, attending traditional masses for over 30 years now, um, I've been moved to tears many times. Um, just either, usually by the splendor of a liturgy. Um, for example, there's one very memorable liturgy I can tell you about. It was in an abbey in, in uh, the Netherlands called Rolduk. Um, the celebrant was Archbishop Alexander Sample, uh, the Archbishop of Portland, Oregon. And um, he was invited to a conference on the sacred liturgy to which I was also invited. And he gave a talk, I gave a talk. Uh, at that conference, and we actually were part of a roundtable panel discussion as well. And I got to sit next to him at the closing banquet, which was really neat, because then I got to talk to him for about an hour, um, which was a, a great privilege. But, um, but he was the celebrant for a pontifical solemn mass in this medieval um, abbey with uh, incredibly high Gothic windows. And, you know, just the ceremonial and all of the ministers at a pontifical mass there are many ministers you know the, the whole sanctuary was full of ministers wearing the most beautiful vestments and the sunlight was streaming through the windows and the incense was billowing up and the organ was playing and the chant scola was singing it was like this it was a heavenly experience it was a transcendent experience and i was definitely teared up by that liturgy um, just i think just the sense of overwhelming beauty and glory Recently, uh, it's been all over the news, Bishop Barron interviewed Hollywood star Shiloh LaBeouf. As we know, Shiloh converted, converted to the faith while playing St. Padre Pio. And that, in that interview, Shia talked about the Latin Mass, how it affects him so deeply. Why do you think so many young people are gravitating to the Latin Mass? Well, I mean, he himself said in that interview, and of course, this has been memed now to death practically, but he said, I, I, he said, I don't, when, when he goes to the, the new mass, at least as it's yeah. celebrated in most places, you know, he, he feels like uh, they're trying to sell him something. And when he goes to the Latin mass, he doesn't feel like anybody's trying to sell him on some program or some platform or some idea. But it's just a kind of, it's a sort of secret that you stumble into. It's like, it's like a, the, the, the traditional Latin mass seems to be like lifting the veil on heavenly worship and you just get to participate in that and you get to to be there and enter into it and so even just by quietly watching it it's transformative it's so powerful it's like a magnet that draws the heart towards the the mystery of the eucharist and this is what pope benedict the 16th said as well all the way back in 2007 in his letter to the bishops he said after the council and the liturgical reform, it was expected that the interest in the old mass would eventually die out as people, as people who had grown up with it died out. He didn't quite say it that bluntly, but that was the idea. Um, but he said, but meanwhile, it's been shown that young people are attracted to the Eucharistic mystery in this form. Um, and I think it's just that, that note of mystery, that note of the full focus and attention is somewhere else. It's not on the congregation. It's not on me. I'm not being put under the spotlight. I'm not being expected to perform. It's not about me. It's about God. And that theocentric nature of the old liturgy is so attractive, especially in a time where we're saturated with commercialism, so people are always trying to sell us something. They're always trying to convince us to be or to do or to look a certain way. 
And to be able to look away from yourself and to be completely caught up in the divine is such a privilege. It's like a rare, you know, gift for us in this day and age. Right? It's almost, you know, like we mentioned before, kind of, it's like gazing on the beatific vision. I mean, you're... Yeah, you're taken out of yourself. Yeah. It's the ecstasy yeah. Yeah. principle that I was talking about. Now, concerning your new book, The Once and Future Roman Rite, you recently posted on Facebook, it is unquestionably the book on which I have worked hardest, of which I am the most proud, and I can't wait for you to see it. <laughs> Can you tell us why this is the case? Yes. yes. So this book, this book is definitely the fruit of of twenty years worth of thinking and writing. Um, we have it right here. Sorry to interrupt, but right yeah, yeah. right behind. <laughs> uh, and uh, and you know what what I've what I've realized over the years. Um, I mean, there are things about all of my books on the liturgy that, that, that I appreciate, you know, that I think each book has something to, to give to the reader. I, I wouldn't suggest that this new book supplants the old ones. It's, it, they all have their own focus and their, their own purpose. Um, but what I've realized after all this time is just how profound, how, at what a deep level are the differences between the revised and reformed uh, mass of Paul the Sixth and all of the sacramental rites of Paul the Sixth and the whole and the divine office of Paul the Sixth and everything. Paul the Sixth gave the church essentially a new form of worship in every respect, in 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 every at every level and in every area. Um, how profound the differences are between that and the traditional liturgy of the church. Um, I think most people who attend the Latin Mass will instantly see many differences, um, especially if, if compared to uh, like what you would find at any random, you know, look up in the phone book local parish, Catholic parish, and you go to that. Between that and, say, a, a Mass that has a lot of silence, that has lots of chant, where the priest is facing eastwards, away, you know, with the people in one direction um, towards the east, which represents the risen Christ and the Christ who is to come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Um, you know, they'll see these obvious differences, and those differences are hugely important. But there are much deeper differences, too, almost what I would call on the genetic level, not on the superficial level, but on the genetic level in terms of like the very material and the very concepts and the very principles of the rubrics and so on. Um, and so in this book, I was able, I think, finally to articulate fully what is it that is so different about these these rites um, to such an extent that I come to the conclusion, which, of course, is will be controversial for some readers, that there is only one Roman rite. And it's not the right of Paul VI, but it's the right that the Church of Rome always celebrated going all the way back to the fourth century, at least the fourth century in terms of its Latin form. Um, you know, and this is what I'm calling the Roman right, the once and future Roman right. Along those same lines, what does the traditional Latin mass offer, particularly to the church, you know, without using a, anything else to contrast it with simply looking at it in an isolation what are the, I guess, what would you say the most beautiful elements of the Tridentine Rite that enrich the church as a whole? Um, I mean, I did mention earlier the theocentricity, the, the really intense focus on God, um, which almost in a way seems to ignore the people, but it ignores them in order to fold them into something greater than themselves and to draw them out of themselves um, into the, the heavenly worship of the Lamb of God. Um, but I, I also think that there's a kind of, like there's a kind of gritty realism to the prayers of the old mass. It takes sin and salvation very seriously, the need for grace to do anything good, um, our fallen condition, the weaknesses of our fallen condition, the temptations, um, uh, the, the need for militancy, uh, for conversion. There are many themes like this that are prominent in the old liturgy when you look at the text of it that are kind of muted or even silenced in other, you know, in, in more recent liturgies. Um, and so I think, I think there's, a, there's a whole school of what you could call traditional Catholic attitudes and thought um, that's in, that are embodied in the traditional Missal, the Tridentine Missal. Um, and we need to hear those truths because those are exactly the truths that are most being denied or forgotten right now. So there's been a great attack on both human life and as we know, the attack on the Latin Mass, one involves biological life and the other on supernatural life. Do you see any similarities between these two attacks, both of which are meant to bring life to the world and, and both are reflections of God himself in heaven? 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the basic problem of, of modernity, I would say, is that um, modern thought, modern philosophy, and then modern culture following from those things is, is egocentric and individualistic. It, it really, it, it emphasizes the atomic individual. You know, it's really about me, myself, and I. You know, that's, that's what you get beginning with Descartes, um, the kind of the father of modern philosophy. And you, you see it just unfolding, and I would even say unraveling um, over all the centuries until you get to the radical individualism, which is really empty of meaning that you see now, something like transgenderism, where people just want to define who and what they are, and they just by their own will, by their sheer willpower, as if they were God for themselves and as if they were creating themselves, right? Which, of course, is completely false. And that's why there's so much unhappiness in the modern world. People want to act like God. They want to be God. And you can't be God if you're a creature. And that's going to lead to, to misery and to sin. And it's going to lead to insanity, actually. If you really, I mean, I think Friedrich Nietzsche, part of the reason why he went insane, uh, it was not just, you know, syphilis, but, but it was, it was uh, his, his nihilistic philosophy is so inhuman that it actually, um, it, it destroys the will to live. It, it, it makes you go crazy, right? So the, the problem with modernity is egocentricity, individualism, and, um, you know, traditional liturgy is a kind of uh, um, healing remedy and medicine and balm for that. And it, it, it takes us um, out of ourselves and, and away from, from that, from those errors. You touched on this a little bit, but why do we need the traditional Latin Mass now, even more so? And Because you argue that it's not a fad, an aesthetic whim, or preferential taste, but something very close to the identity itself of the Roman Church mm. that cannot be substituted for. How is this so? Yeah, well, the basic concept of tradition, um, you know, has, has been superficialized. Some people think tradition just means, you know, any old thing that's been handed down or even anything that I decide has value. So I can say, you know, as of today, it's a tradition that we do such and such. Well, that's kind of an abuse of, of language. I mean, tradition doesn't just begin right now because I say it does. Um, no, the, the real concept of tradition, or paradosis in Greek, is the whole inheritance of the church from each age that is passed down to the next, as from a father to a child. Um, and that inheritance begins with the apostles, and of course the core of it, the heart of it, is apostolic tradition and the deposit of faith. But we need to think about that as being like a jewel in a gold setting, and the gold setting is, is, what, is, is, is what the church develops over all the centuries of her prayer and devotion and piety and theology as the appropriate sort of surrounding for that apostolic inheritance. Um, so the, the, the reason why liturgies grow and develop over the centuries, both in East and West, is because of this natural desire on the part of human beings to, to embellish and enrich what they love and to give it their best and to give God their best. Um, and so we have this sum total, our heritage, made up of ecclesiastical traditions and of apostolic tradition uh, and of dominical tradition, what Jesus himself gave us, all, all of these things combined are what we mean by tradition as Catholics, and all of it is valuable, even if you can make distinctions within it. It's all valuable for us, and it's all something that unfolded under the guidance of divine providence and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I mean, Christ said, I will give my spirit to you to, to, to lead you into the fullness of truth. That fullness of truth includes the fullness of the liturgical worship of the church. And so it's, it's literally absurd for Catholics at a later age to turn their back on a huge part of the tradition of the church. That's like turning their back on divine providence and on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's very serious, you know. Um, so it's, yeah. In the Once and Future Roman Rite, you so beautifully wrote the following. This is what we see in the lives of the great mystics. It is the liturgy that forms and grounds and permeates their interior life, keeping it healthy, strong, balanced, rich, and fruitful, preventing it from veering off into the arbitrariness, sentimentality, idiosyncrasy, pride, or vanity. The interior life of grace hidden in the soul is reflected, represented, exemplified in the exterior psyocony of the traditional liturgy. It is the mystical life of the indwelling trinity, writ large, 
translated into the language of ritual, ceremony, and prayer, enacted in the chorophathy of ministers, brushed upon words, savored in melodious chant, nestled in thundering silence. So beautiful. How does the Roman rite specifically form the interior life of a person? Perhaps you could cite a few examples of the saints as well in there. Mm. Well, I mean, the traditional Roman rite is a very complex form of worship um, that it, it demands of you many different dispositions. And Dietrich von Hildebrand was really great about drawing these things out. It demands of you a certain humility that you have to submit to the detailed rubrics and their regimentation. You have to allow yourself to become an instrument or a tool in God's hands. That's especially true for the clergy and the ministers um, and the singers. Um, it, it, it demands of you a certain bodily discipline because there's a lot of kneeling and it, it demands of you um, receptivity that you have to, in a way, you have to let God hollow you out and fill you with, with, with grace. And the, the, the liturgy exemplifies that in many ways. Um, you know, the, it exemplifies the principle of John the Baptist, you know, um, um, he must increase and I must decrease. So there's a real humility there. There's a, there's a, I guess I would say the traditional liturgy really cultivates the habit of listening, of listening deeply to the word of God and to and and responding to it not necessarily just with lips or with bodily actions, but with the heart and with the mind and with faith, which are of the yeah. which is of the mind. Um, and so even like the way that active participation is understood, it's there very much in the old liturgy, but it's a more interior form of active participation, which is the more important and the more fundamental kind of participation. I mean, just even going back to the rule of St. Benedict, right, the first words, listen, you know, so St. Benedict, the whole liturgy, the idea of listening. St. Mm -hmm. Thomas Aquinas, one of your heroes, died around, it's funny, I looked up the age, they say it's around 49, yes. 48 or 40, 48 or 49. And yet he accomplished so much with God's grace. He is the Catholic Church's greatest theologian and philosopher. Since his passing in the 13th century, no saint has ever come close to writing something like the Summa Theologica. You called the once and future Roman rite your magnum opus, your greatest work, involving 25 years of research, almost half of your life. Dr. K, you're still very young in your early 50s. Where do you go, for, where do you go after this book? Well, I, I, as I mentioned to you, and I think for good reason, um, the, the next two books that I worked on after that, uh, one was on marriage and family and pro-life issues uh, with, a, with, a, with a lot of consideration on the questions of contraception and abortion. And so that was just a different direction. You know, you, 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 when you finish a book like Once a Future Roman Rite, you don't try to do the same thing over again. You know, you have to move in a different direction. Um, and then the other book about sacred music, which we touched on, um, and of course that's related, very intimately related to the liturgy, but it's its own area, its own focus. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, but frankly, there's just, the Catholic faith is so, um, so enormous. It's such a, it's such an endless world that uh, I, I'm quite confident that I'll never run out of things <laughs> to think about it, to write about, you know, God willing. Yeah. Let's return to St. Thomas Aquinas. The following is related from the Butler's Lives of the Saints. I know you've heard the story before on the Feast of St. Nicholas in, in 1273. Aquinas was celebrating Mass when he received a revelation that, that so affected him that he wrote and dictated to, uh, that he dictated no more, leaving his great work unfinished. To, to Brother Reginald, he replied, The end of my labors has come. All that I have written appears to be so much straw after the things that have been revealed to me. When later asked by Reginald to return to writing, Aquinas said, I can write no more. I have seen things that, my writings, that make my writings like straw. Do you ever feel like St. Thomas Aquinas and what you have written appears to be straw compared to the traditional Latin liturgy itself, and how so? Yes, actually, I, I frequently feel that way. Um, I, and one of, the, one of the reasons why um, I keep writing is because I feel as if it's impossible to capture the, the, the wonder and the beauty and the depth of this reality of the whole liturgical tradition of the Western Church, and really of of both the Eastern and Western Church over the past 2,000 years. And I, I like to say 3,000 years because we also take into account Israel and the worship of Israel in the temple and the synagogue, which is part of traditional Christian worship as well, um, integrated into it. I, I feel as if it's impossible to do justice to it. It's so grand. It's so awesome. It's so 
intricate and subtle. And so I do often feel, even, even when I've given something my best shot, that, ah, oh, you know, that no one will be able to, to capture this uh, in words or even in the greatest poetry. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, but I think that's wonderful. It's wonderful to be, to be confronted with realities that you can only gesture towards and grope at and, and maybe tiptoe up to. But at the end of the day, you're, you're going to fall silent um, before the majesty and the, and the mystery of it. Yeah. It's kind of like the young boy They'd say it was right, the infant Jesus that appeared to St. Augustine on the seashore. Yes. And, and St. Augustine was trying to comprehend the mystery of God. And uh, I don't know the whole story behind that, but I think he said, like, it, it'd be easier for, maybe you can tell. Right, it, to put and, the ocean into this shell, you know, or into this hole, yeah. than for you to put the mystery of the Trinity into your mind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of like that same thought process, right? Yes, yes. Final question, uh, the moment of death. Most of us do not ponder enough. And St. Benedict said that we must keep death daily before our eyes. Uh, when you die, what do you pray that your greatest contribution to the Catholic Church be? Oh, well, really, the, the, the number one thing that I hope that the Lord can do through my work is to reawaken in the minds of Catholics um, the central and constitutive role of tradition for us. Uh, and can reinvigorate our attachment to that. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, Doctor, it's been an honor and a privilege to have you here um, for this interview, and uh, we're so excited um, for your, your new release that's coming out on October 4th, The Once and Future Roman Rite. We ask that um, all you viewers to please go and get this book and read it, share it with others. It's a, it's a treasure. It's the fruit of 25 years of Dr. K's sacrifice, and uh, again, just please check that out. It'll be available at TAN Books on October 4th, so thank you so much.